Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Laura Thompson, and I am the manager of the Singing River Genealogy and Local History Library. And today we are exhibiting the Stone Smith collection that was generously donated by Stone's family members, his granddaughter specifically, uh, Miss Beth Rollins. I'm going to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there were three Heddle brothers. The first brother, John, stowed away on a ship in Greenwich, Scotland, bound for America. His journey would bring him to California. In 1845, John established himself as a blacksmith and changed his surname to Smith, presumably for his profession. William, the second brother to arrive, met John in California and following his brother's lead, changed his surname to Smith. David Hiddle, the last brother to arrive, came to America aboard the ship United States. It is believed he arrived between 1858 and 1860. He began his travels in New York and worked his way south. He traveled to Savannah, Georgia, and then to Montgomery and Selma, Alabama, where he heard that the South, or Confederate States, seceded from the North. After leaving Alabama, he met with his brother, John, in New Orleans, and soon traveled to Pascagoula to meet with his brother, William. David describes the final leg of his journey to Smith Lake across Elder's, Fer across Elder's Ferry in his manuscript, Travels in America. This was a glorious drive. It was the quiet, strange sublimity of the mighty forest. Little else but pine trees was there. The noise overhead was that of a huge avalanche, as they bent and rustled their heads as if bowing in great obeisance to the great original. Arriving at Elder's Ferry, my brother gave a loud whoop. And as the echo died away, the ferryman appeared on the other side, making ready with his rudely constructed flag to take man and beast across. This was done by a rope extending right across the river. It was fastened at each end to the trunk of a huge tree, the rope passing through the two grooved pulleys in the flat, and walking to the other, she was propelled to the other side of the river. Once settled on Smith Lake, the three brothers constructed a house, sawmill, gristmill, lumber yard, stables, and slave quarters. The three enjoyed some success in the lumber business until the beginning of the Civil War. When Northern forces blockaded Southern ports, two schooners belonging to the Hiddle Smith brothers were seized and they lost $20,000 worth of lumber. This event ultimately caused the sawmill to fall. John became involved in a conspiracy for the Confederates during the Civil War and has been seemingly lost to time. David Hiddle traveled back to New Orleans to work in a mutiny to work in a munitions factory before returning home to Scotland, getting married, and immigrating to Australia. William Smith chose to stay in Moss Point and started filming. Arthur Hiddle Smith was born November 22, 1868 to Louisa Vaughn and William Smith in the family home of Smith Lake. As a young man, Arthur made a name for himself by farming the land around Smith Lake and selling his produce. After ensuring he had a house built, complete with a $400 Kanabi piano, he proposed to and married Ella Brantley Brooks of Brooksville, Mississippi. Together they had six children. Jesse, born 1892. Arthur Vaughn, born 1894. Lucille, born 1896. Mabel, born 1898. William, born 1900. And Stone McInnes, born 1907. After moving to the city proper, it seems that Arthur spent time in Mobile learning how to embalm and started an undertaking business, later partnering with H.A. Fales upon returning to Moss Point. In addition to his entrepreneurial endeavors, Arthur was extremely involved in his community. He served as county treasurer, justice of the peace, served on the Moss Point school board, and most notably became the second mayor of the city in 1905 and later sheriff in 1907. During his term as mayor, he was responsible for starting the local chapter of the Elks Lodge, creating a sewer system for the city, and installing Moss Point's first sidewalks. In a recollection of their father, one of his children writes, in the sidewalks, soon as we sat down to supper, the phone would start ringing. Once it was Miss Maggie Myers, and a mad Maggie she was. I think Papa was no more bothered than a horse's bothered by a mat. He teased her saying she would enjoy promenading with her bow. Arthur's greatest achievement as mayor, as mayor though, was the construction of Central High School. 
Ellen Dantzler, upon his death in 1906, contributed $10,000 towards the construction of a new school in Moss Point. Written accounts vary in author's attitude concerning this donation, but both agree that he felt such a sum would not suffice the needs of the community. And I remember, and I remember Papa, Lucille writes, during the time, during this time, Mr. Ellen Dantzler died, leaving $10,000 to build a school building. Well, that was just not enough to build the one Papa had in mind. He had much opposition, but stood his ground for a $30,000 building and won the fight. Did he ever lose one? <laughs> I remember the laying of the cornerstone and how proud I was. I always considered that school a memorial to him, his crowning achievement. Another account written by Stone McKenna Smith, Arthur's youngest child, is the culmination of his family members' recollections on the matter. When Arthur was mayor, the Danslers offered to give $10,000 to build a new school. Most city leaders wanted to accept it and build a $10,000 school. Papa said, no, it's not going to be a Dantzler school. We'll take the money, add $10,000 to it, and build a $20,000 school, which will be our school. He won this fight in Moss Point High School, from which I graduated in 1925, was never known as Dantzler High. The funds raised for this building of the schoolhouse were gathered in bonds, the first bonds ever to be issued in the city of Moss Point. The laying of the cornerstone for Moss Point High School took place in July 1907. An article in the newspaper describes it thus. The school children marched through the main street of the city to the school grounds. A stand had been erected and beautifully decorated for the occasion, and despite the hot and sultry weather, an immense crowd of at least 800 people was on hand to witness the laying of the first cornerstone in Moss Point. The Masonic Temple performed the laying of the cornerstone in, in the northeast corner of the building. The cornerstone was described as a solid white marble stone measuring 30 inches, with the name Ellen Dantzler inscribed on one side wreathed in two palm leaves. Underneath the palm leaves was inscribed masonry per Masonic wall. The other side featured the inscription, erected 1907, A.H. Smith Mayor, J.J. McIntosh, C.M. Fairley, N.A. Broadway, and S.F. Henry Alderman. Building Committee, J. Bounds, Chairman, F. Colmer, and A.M. Cowan, Architects Drago and Smith, Contractor John Wright. The stone having been found plumb, square, and level, and the corn of nourishment, the wine of refreshment, and the oil of joy spread on the stone. Moving into August of 1907, Arthur Smith was elected Sheriff of Moss Point and enjoyed two years in the position. Arthur Hiddle Smith died March 9, 1909, after a short battle with pneumonia. His loss, was felt, his loss was felt acutely not only by his family, but also friends in the community of Moss Point. His obituary, published in the paper on March 13, 1909, reads in part, After a short illness, Sheriff Arthur Hiddle Smith died at his home in Moss Point on Tuesday morning in his 40th year. He was honest, determined, straightforward, and sympathetic, all of which qualities go to make up a true man. His loss will be keenly felt for Mr. Smith was full of zeal and enterprise and was continually advocating the civic improvement of the entire county. Seldom has a public official received such marked respect as was shown at the funeral of the deceased which took place Wednesday afternoon from his late residence. With the death of Arthur, Ella Brooks was left to raise six children by herself. Stone McInnes, being the youngest, born in 1907, did not have the privilege of knowing his father. He did, however, have the advantage of older brothers for better or for worse. His eldest brother, Arthur Bond, was 13 years his senior and became a sort of father figure to him. Stone writes that he only ever knew his brother as an adult. The dynamic between them seemed to be quite nurturing with Stone writing. He taught me all of the things a growing boy should know. Later in life, when his influence grew, he helped me as a young man trying to make it. There was a time when one of his severe lectures got me off a bad road and into a good one. Where Arthur Vaughn filled the role of the surrogate father to Stone, his brother William satisfied the role of mischievous older brother. At seven years older than Stone, William obviously knew the ways of the world his youth afforded him. Stone recounts of his brother. He taught me many things that a young boy ought to know but seldom learns from his parents, and some things that my mother would have been shocked to know I was learning at all. Stone would go on to graduate in 1925 from Moss Point High School, the very building his late father fought to build. 
Upon graduation, he worked in a print shop in Pascagoula so he could help with the care of his ailing mother. Ella Brooks Smith would ultimately succumb to her illness on May 6, 1930. She was 61 years old. After the death of his mother, Stone moved to Bay St. Louis and lived with his eldest sister, Jessie, and her husband, Herbert Canty. At this time, the Great Depression was beginning to take its toll and Stone found himself unemployed. Jessie, being the big sister that she was, made her husband exercise his position in Standard Oil Company and give her baby brother a job driving fuel trucks around Hancock County. In 1934, Stone moved to Jackson. The Great Depression was still looming and Stone found employment with the help of his brother, Arthur Vaughn, in a clerical position adding payroll sums. This fostered in him an interest in accounting. While working for the Emergency Relief Administration, Stone com completed an accountant correspondence course and began doing accounting work for the administration and only moved upwards from there. He became responsible for auditing county administrations and later began work as an accountant for the Mississippi Life Insurance Company. During his climb of the career ladder, Stone met and married his wife, Jessie May, in 1936. Their first child, Arthur Connor, was born in 1937, and their daughter, Shirley Stone, being born in 1938. The, St Excuse me. the Smith family would bounce between the coast and Jackson during Stone's insurance career. In 1961, Shirley married and welcomed her first child and Stone's first grandchild, Elizabeth, in 1962. In 1964, his second grandchild, Patty, was born. Tragically, Jessie May died in 1969 from a prolonged illness. Her death affected Stone and his family deeply, but he found solace in his grandchildren. In his account of the event, he writes, Beth and Patty seemed to know I was hurting and made me lovingly aware of their love and understanding. In 1970, Shirley and Thomas Rollins adopted Andrew Thomas, giving, three, giving Stone three grandchildren to dote over. In 1973, Stone retired from accounting and opened his own law practice. He had been admitted to the bar in 1952 after taking law classes at night. He specialized in tax law and won a large settlement for Standard Life Insurance Company early in his career. In 1977, Stone moved to Pascagoula to be closer to family. In the time between Jesse May's death, he remarried to a woman named Gladys, whom he had known in his youth in 1979. Stone's writings end with him talking about the love he has for his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Stone Smith passed away on May 1st, 2003, at the age of 95. He is buried in Jackson, Mississippi. His writings and that of his family members offer, offer a unique first-hand account of Moss Point when she was just a fledgling city. The manuscripts provide in-depth descriptions of the city and parts beyond and captivating prose that is easy to get lost in. The Hiddle Smith family has played a large role in shaping the history of our community. It has been a, a distinct and absolute pleasure to accept this collection into my library and research this family. Thank you. Joan McGinnis Smith, a walk down Main Street in the 19s. Main Street in those days was as Canal is to New Orleans or Government Street to Mobile, with the size greatly reduced, but the relationship the same. People lived there and worked there. Business was done there. Whatever happened, happened there, or at least was talked about it there. Leaving our house by way of the front door and the concrete walk, we will pass between two large palm bushes, not trees. Exit through an iron gate and take the sidewalk to the left, north. Let's pretend that we're going to the post office. The post office was about 300 feet north of our front yard and on the way we passed Burnham's Drug Store, a residence and a hardware store. The car line crossed Main Street just north of the post office and next we passed the Pascagoula National Bank. Next to the bank was the Oyster Bar. This is in all caps because of its importance. Oysters on the half shell, wow all you could eat and very, very cheap. Crossing the street, we find Mrs. Prouse's restaurant. When I had the money, 10 cents, that's where I got the hamburger. No Whoppers, just real ground beef, onion and mustard. And of course she served other food, but who cared? Burnham's Drug Store housed other businesses, which were variously a gross store, grocery store, a hardware store, and a furniture store. 
Upstairs was the doctor, Ely, and the dentist, Coley. Together they took care of emergencies, Dr. Coley assisting Dr. Ely, something like a top-rate nurse. Both were great guys. When I had dental work done, Dr. Coley would say, before we start, you go to the bathroom. I don't want my chair to get wet. <laughs> Dr. Ely delivered all of the babies in Moss Point and North thereof. Sometimes he would let us go with him in his Model T, and sometimes we got home very, very late. Number five on the map was the undertaking business that Papa started and continued, and was continued after his death by Mr. Fails. Originally, the hearse was drawn by two beautiful black horses, but of course, later, the mid-teens, was replaced by an auto hearse. After automobiles came, the business started a taxi service of sorts with Model T Fords. Some of the drivers used to take me on trips and sometimes they let me drive at age 13. Across the car line from the undertaking business was a vacant building where a retired doctor holding the office of Justice of the Peace held court. Some very learned lawyers would wax eloquently there on minor cases just to keep their legal teeth sharp. And we boys were allowed to listen and wonder. Sometimes the judge wondered too. Next was Jim Howell's men's clothing store. Often Jim would stand in front and shout about his goods and its quality. We liked Jim because he took us up the river fishing. Next was the barber shop, which might also be called the information center. Next mm -hmm. to the barber shop was a vacant lot where the medicine shows and the gadget sales were held. With a capable barker shouting from a wood platform, the colored water that he called medicine would cure all ills. And the gadgets would work well for the barker, but not for you at home. But in those days, that was entertainment. Next, we find another clothing store and the Merchants and Marine Bank. We are almost directly across from the Smith House. Our walk to the post office covered the most important parts of Main Street the whole of the active parts being about one half mile. A very active street for a little town of 2,500. As you can see on the larger map, Moss Point is a water town, surrounded by the Escatapa River, circling around the north and northeast, the Pascagoula River on the west, and the bayou cutting the town in half. Being a water town, it's evident that the fishing, that fishing was a major activity. The Pascagoula River originates miles north of Moss Point and forks into two east-west branches about 10 miles north. The smaller Escatapa River empties into East Pascagoula at the northwest tip of Moss Point. Both east and west Pascagoula Rivers empty into the Mississippi Sound, with about four miles separating the two river mouths. And now my dry mouth is going to stop reading and Cindy Levesque, another grandchild, is going to finish up. I like that it starts with the schoolhouse. I am a teacher. <laughs> the schoolhouse was across the bayou, about a mile. And of course we walked. Of course we walked. How else to get there? Only two or three automobiles were around in the teens, and very few in the 20s. There were three routes from Main Street to the school and all crossed the bayou. There were two streets proper and the car line. The car line ran from Dantzler's Mill to the west, then east past the school to cross Main Street, then turning south to the Pascagoula. Some of my classmates lived in Escatapa, close to Smith Lake. <laughs> the distance to Main Street by dirt road was about six miles, but remember, no automobiles, or out by water two miles. They would row a skiff to Main Street, remember also, no outboard motors, then walk a mile to school. What did we do for entertainment to pass the time? It's hard to say now. With all of the diversions available to us now, both in and out of the home, I sometimes wonder what we did do but we were happy and you you must remember these things you now think of as ordinary were then new and exciting to us the new outside movie theater mid-teens called the air dome although silent was an excitement and a few years later when it was enclosed in a building 
it caused another thrill. Record players in existence for many years were made more user friendly and with improved sound. The circus came around once or twice a year with lectures and performers of various types held forth in an existing hall. But mostly we visited. People would sit on their porches and be joined by walkers. And we just said, let's go see Mrs. Jones. No need to call. At home we sang together often, Mama playing the piano. All had fair voices and Mama had some real good old songs. We were among the limited number of families who had telephones. It was the Hello Central, get me Mrs. Brown type. Later, we were assigned two or three digit numbers. You had to crank the phone, which was rather large and mounted on the wall. We went fishing, hunting, drank the river water, and slept on the ground. Got there by either walking or by means of an inboard motorboat. When we got to our desired location, there were probably skiffs tied up at the bank. Nobody minded you using a skiff. Just furnish your own oars or paddle and tie it up where you got it. In those days, houseboats were really houseboats. That is, a small house built on a barge. Often families would go upriver on one of these things for maybe a week. There were bunks and a stove. No electricity, no fans, no phone. It sounds like a really special time.